In western lands beneath the sun, the flowers may rise in spring, the trees may bud, the waters run, the merry finches sing. Or there may be tis cloudless night, and swaying beeches bare, the elven stars as jewels white, amid their branching hair. Though here at journey's end I lie, in darkness buried deep, beyond all towers strong and high, beyond all mountains steep, above all shadows rides the sun, and stars for ever dwell. I shall not say the day is done, nor bid the stars farewell. Middle Earth is many things to many people, so much so that listing those possible things would be exhaustive and redundant. However, the one I want to focus on here is the journey. This is a journey from place to place, from locale to locale, and the events that happen within each. Journeying is something that's often skimmed over in many games, and used as establishing shots and montage in films. This week, we'll be taking a look at an entry that attempts to bring that journey to the forefront in The One Ring. How does it hold up? Let's find out. The One Ring runs at about 336 pages, and has a very classical book appearance. This particular art style is hardly new for the output of Cubicle 7, given some of the previous work at the time, like Lone Wolf and Yggdrasil. That said, it's written in a far more modern setup with a better flowing format, but some of its writing style could arguably be seen as heavy-handed in parts. Your mileage may vary on this, but it's a case of devil in the details. Character creation is less involved than before, but still with a degree of customization within it, almost life path-like. We'll be exploring this with Muldan once more, this time making him a barding due to my core book only rules. The first half starts with choosing a heroic culture, essentially the group you came from at an early age. In our case, we'll go with barding, and thus our standard of living is listed as prosperous, and we gain stout-hearted as our cultural blessing, allowing us to roll with an advantage when making valor tests. This also grants a pool of common skills, weapon skills, and specialties. Our common skills start out as Awe 1, Explore 2, Song 1, Craft 1, Inspire 2, Travel 2, Insight 2, Courtesy 2, Battle 2, Persuade 3, Search 1, and Lore 1. Making note that Inspired is a favored skill for us. For weapon skills, we pick between one of two packages. We pick the former one, which gives us Swords 2, Spear 1, and Dagger 1. For specialties, we can choose two from a given package, and in our case, we'll go with Smithcraft and Old Lore as our specialties. Next, we pick from one of the culture's associated backgrounds, which allows for another favored skill, a basic attribute spread, and a set of distinctive features. We'll go with Dragon Eyed as our background, which makes our starting attributes to be Body 5, Heart 6, and Wits 3. Awe becomes a favored skill, and Adventurous and Determined are two distinctive features. The second half is Customization, wherein we breathe a little more spark into the character. Well, the first stop in this is calling, essentially the answer to the question of why someone would leave the comforts of home to brave the wilds outside of it. This grants two favored skill groups, an additional trait and a shadow weakness, a means for their motivation to work against them. We'll go with Warden in this case, gaining the personality and survival skill groups at one, the folklore trait, and the lure of power as our shadow weakness. Second, favorite attributes. To generate these, we add 3 to 1 attribute, 2 to a second, and 1 to a third. In our case, our favorite attributes are Body 7, Heart 8, and Wits 4. Third, we have 10 points to spend on common skills and or weapon skills. We'll spend this in putting a rank in Athletics, Awareness, Healing, Hunting, and Swords. Finally, Derive Statistics, the first being Endurance and Hope which are the two most vital resources, endurance being self-explanatory and hope being the mental equivalent. In our case, we have an endurance of 28 and a hope of 14. Now following that, we have a damage modifier of 4, a parry of 3, valor of 2, and wisdom of 1. Valor and wisdom being kind of a level equivalent, but not quite. Now having a valor of 2 allows us to gain a cultural virtue. In our case, we'll go with Swordmaster. Character creation is a bit more narrativist 
than in previous iterations, and this is where a kind of organization issue props up. In certain parts, the game falls into the habit of not explaining enough. This mainly goes into equipment, which is a little fast and loose for me, especially with the inclusion of encumbrance, but the loss of any sort of starting money. I suppose this is the result of the game using a non-standard approach to currency, but it's still something I had to note. Beyond that, I could see some taking issue with the pick-based approach of the creation process, finding it too limiting. Now, personally, I see it as a middle ground. It's not the first time I'll be saying something to that extent. The One Ring uses a die pool system split between 6-sided success die and 12-sided feet die. The feet die, of which there is always only one, is always rolled by default, and results of 1 through 10 are rolled normally. 11s are an automatic success, and 12s count as a zero. Success die are based on the skill used. 1 to 5s are read as normal, and 6s indicate a greater degree of success. Regardless, these die rolled are compared to a target number to determine success. The part that might be a bit contentious is the original die having symbols on certain results. I don't have an issue with this personally, but I do feel I should note it. Attributes, I should note, are not based in the typical attribute plus skill formula, but instead as a bonus at the cost of hope, adding the attribute total to the roll. If the skill used in the roll is a favored one, then the favored attribute rating is used in this manner. Traits, which can take the form of distinctive features and specialties in this system, are more of a queue setup, allowing players to invoke a trait to gain an automatic success to intervene, or to gain an advancement point. Now, combat is not exactly a grid-based affair, but more of a stance-based one. Encounters revolve around four stances, forward, open, defensive, and rearward. This determines when a participant can act, the difficulty of said action, often modified by their target's parry rating, and in addition, each stance has an action that can be declared as well as standard attacks. This makes an interesting spin on combat where the emphasis is on a combined whole rather than a group of individuals. However, I hinted that the journey takes greater precedence in this game, so let's dive into that. It starts with four roles that the players assign to their characters. Guide, Scout, Huntsman, and Lookout Man. Beyond that, a journey is separated into five steps. First, setting a route, typically placed on their map or divided into legs. Second is distance, i.e. how many hexes that party must travel in order to get to their destination. Third is terrain, which acts as a multiplier for distance, adding up each leg with different terrain. Fourth is speed, which determines how long it takes to reach the destination. This is typically based on whether you're traveling on foot, horseback, or boat. Finally, fatigue tests. The number of times fatigue must be rolled, usually with the travel skill. This can be further modified by the season you're traveling in, since you may have to do less tests in summer than in winter, for instance. If a 12 on the feet die is rolled, it means that some sort of encounter or obstacle occurs, targeting a specific role for its effects or the entire party. If there's anything within the game I could say would be controversial, it's the use of symbols. I have no issue with it, but what it does weird me out on are the suggested alternatives when it comes to the feet die. I think people could make sense of 1 and 12 being the best or worst result instead of the given format. That said, the idea of having a higher chance for an automatic success than the D20 systems rubs me the wrong way. It might be a little more receptive to me if it was an exploding die instead of an automatic, but that's just me. Either way, this is clearly a system with a specific playstyle in mind, one might, that might lean a little bit European, for lack of a better word. If that playstyle doesn't mesh with your tables, there might be some issues. Doubly so if you have more traditional grid combat based players around your given table. It might take them a little time to adjust. I read somewhere that this is a great Tolkien game, but only if you know your Tolkien. I don't necessarily think that's fair, since that could apply to every one of the games we've covered in this series. Middle-earth will always have a degree of lore lockout, even with the attention that the films brought. That said, The One Ring seems to place more emphasis on role-playing in Middle-earth than role-playing Lord of the Rings. 
it's in service to that goal that the game leans more favorably towards a hex crawl and theater of the mind approaches over a long term than anything else. The latter part of that might take some getting used to for those accustomed to grid combat. In a weird way, the game reminds me of Pendragon. Not in the sense of a die system or mechanics, but in the tone that it aims for. In both cases, the passage of time takes the most precedence. But while Pendragon is somewhat static, since you're going to be in or near your castle in some form or another throughout its campaigns, the One Ring is mobile. In both cases, it's clearly not something that lends itself to one-shots. However, I can only speak from my own experiences in this, and thus I give the One Ring a stamp of strongly recommended. If you come from a more D20-based background, that rating might not be as high, but it's clear the design of this game is built around an inherent goal. Arguably, that goal is accomplished too well with some of its issues in organization and writing, but this is a Middle-Earth game more than anything else, and tailor-made to a given goal unlike some of the previous games covered. After all, Middle-Earth role-playing was adapted from the Rollmaster rule set. The Middle-Earth Adventure game was further adapted from that. Decipher Lord of the Rings was building on the CODA system, but the One Ring doesn't have such a background, and that ultimately will be to its advantage. With that, this chapter in our journey comes to an end. But where one chapter ends, another begins. Despite its ups and downs, I'm still hesitant about running a Lord of the Rings game anytime in the future, especially given some of its fans, for the same reason I'm hesitant on running a game in most established universes. Too many folk who are hung up on the right way, while I'm someone who prefers using the sandbox that RPGs afford me to its fullest extent. However, of the four presented here, the, the ones you'd most likely see me run are the, the One Ring or Decipher Lord of the Rings, since those I could get the most out of. Just don't expect me to do some late Third Age stuff. I'm kind of done with that. But perhaps that is a tale for another day.